<coughs> well, following Jerry's uh, brilliant talk, I feel a bit intimidated, actually. That was really great, Jerry. Um, like Jerry, of course, I was uh, very, very much shaped by the science fiction of the 1950s. Um, my earliest memories are the sort of night skies in Derbyshire. We didn't have sodium street lighting in those days, right at the beginning. And the night skies were absolutely magnificent. And to me, as a child, uh, Mars was actually closer than London because I, I, could, I could actually see Mars. And uh, <laughs> L London was an almost impossible place for me to get to. And obviously science fiction started to appear. But I have to say that uh, in the first instance... Um, Eagle didn't actually impinge on my mind, and for the, uh, the first few years of uh, my conscious life, it was actually astronomy that, uh, that captured my imagination. Um, but uh, somewhere round about, uh, well, I think I first need to sort of get back and say, who is the person that's actually being influenced here? It's all right standing here at the end of my career, sort of philosophizing on this. But that was the guy that uh, was actually reading and doing this stuff at the time. You can see that uh, the engineering was sort of there right from the beginning. Uh, and I've always been in need of a haircut. I'm actually reasonably well uh, uh, kept today. Um, but uh, right at the beginning, I have to say that uh, the Eagle, although I saw my cousin's copy of it on a fairly regular basis, hadn't actually impinged on my consciousness. But one of the things that, that really was quite evident was the technology. And looking back at it today, some of the uh, uh, technologies are, are really quite interesting. So the impulse drive, for example, so many people have gone back and tried to make that actually work. And with lasers, you, you maybe could. Uh, at the Atomic Energy Authority back in the 1980s, uh, when we were looking at uh, what we were going to do with the World War III battle lasers between thermonuclear conflicts, we uh, actually studied the possibility of using beam lasers to uh, raise satellites to higher orbits. And uh, there is a paper by uh, Robert Bond, my namesake and myself, uh, that actually deals with that. The thing we never managed to make work, of course, was the gravity lock. And uh, one of the things that shows up, Jerry mentioned it, uh, control of gravity has, of course, eluded us. And there are good actual uh, technical reasons why it forever will, uh, as far as we are aware. And uh, so the gravity lock didn't happen. But uh, it's not impossible that the uh, uh, impulse power might. Now, this is where Eagle really first impinged on me. I can't tell you why it occurred, but this particular issue is absolutely locked in my mind because this was the point in which having had a long-term interest in astronomy I suddenly thought one day hang on I don't have to sit here with my telescope I can actually go there and that actually impinged quite uh, graphically on my mind this spaceship of course as Jerry has already alluded to spaceships will never look like that and I think that's a terrible shame because uh, that is such a beautiful vehicle that I feel that one day somebody, when we've got the technology, will build one just for the sake of it. Um, the front has to be made of diamond, by the way. I've investigated that. Provided that you can make that out of diamond, then uh, there's no problem. I'm sure that one day we'll be able to. So having sort of embarked on Operation Saturn and sort of got me sort of technically interested in the fact that you could probably actually uh, fly to some of these places, the first thing I came across was this stuff, monatomic hydrogen. And so, as the comment at the top goes, that was pretty much the conversation as I recall it with my father. And uh, um, it was a long time before I actually found out what monatomic hydrogen actually was. And today, as a rocket uh, propulsion engineer, I have to say that I'm a bit disappointed because monatomic hydrogen really doesn't have uh, the performance that Frank Hampson uh, uh, portrayed here still be interesting if we could get it and it was sort of highly unstable now images like this I, I don't think it's possible for me to express how this type of image influenced my perception of spaceflight the the image at the top here and indeed the previous ones which uh, jerry showed in his presentation of the small monatomic hydrogen development ships uh, sort of uh, being consumed while they're learning how to uh, control the lock wave tuner and keep the monatomic hydrogen under control um, that philosophy of having to have a development program and all of that, eventually, of course, when I became a professional engineer, I got mixed up in development programs. 
but I'd already had a grounding in what a development program was actually like, and it wasn't dissimilar to this. And that's, of course, after World War II, uh, we had an awful lot of development programs and uh, uh, development aircraft, and uh, Jerry has already mentioned uh, uh, Eric uh, Winkle Brown, and the fact that uh, uh, after World War II, we managed to kill 37 test pilots in the first five years. And I'd seen it all in Eagle, of course. It was all good grounding. One of the things I love about this centre picture at the bottom is that, uh, never mind picking up rotation from the Earth's Delta V, if you look at it, this is a flight from Britain out across the Atlantic, crossing South America in a completely retrograde direction. And so we just don't care. And, uh, it's, uh, and the Valiant does a, an interesting <coughs> manoeuvre just so that they can rendezvous with the little ship. I do wish space flight was actually like that. <laughs> now, back in the 1970s, I chanced to meet the evil genius that uh, was uh, in the Eagle. Uh, masquerading as Jerry Webb. Um, <laughs> um, Jerry said that nobody in the uh, Eagle smoked. He's missed out. The one character that yes, actually yes, did, the despite, <laughs> despite, the, <laughs> despite the fact he used a cigarette holder, um, <clears throat> was Dr. Blasco. Dan, Dan smoked the occasional pipe. Dan, Dan did smoke the occasional pipe, that's true. That's You're quite right. Were kind of the rigor for, yeah. for mainly but when I first met Jerry, um, he was tall, slim, elegant, true. Um, I'm not exaggerating here. And I thought, God, he really, he really is Dr. Blasco. I even found he had a sword stick. Um, <laughs> so I, I always was very polite to him and kept out of his way. But, uh, I saw what happened to the airman in this sort of episode down yes. here. But one of the things that uh, was showing up in this series, which you know, in my philosophical later years I realised, the black cats that showed up in this <coughs> were actually uh, unpiloted uh, vehicles used for surveillance on Saturnia. And of course, although they don't look like black cats, this is exactly the situation that's coming about today. UAVs are going to be patrolling our streets within the next sort of 10, 20 years. And so Frank Hampson was very astute in my view that if you really want to sort of keep your population under control, you need the black cats to uh, actually go out there and do the job for you. The other, the other thing that intrigued me at the time uh, it was quite clear that Vora didn't come from the solar system. And that, I don't know why it, it influenced me so much at this time, but the idea that there could be people outside the solar system, all of us back in those days thought, you know, there were going to be Martians, there would be Venusians and so on. But for this character to have come from somewhere else completely, uh, was really, I thought, quite an inspirational uh, and interesting. We've picked the same scene of yeah. Jerry dying with his helmet off at the... Sorry, Busco dying with his helmet <laughs> off at the bottom. <laughs> the other thing that uh, struck a resonance with me was the floating palace, because the floating palace was something that had appeared in Flash Gordon, sort of in the sort of 1920s, 1930s uh, films. And... Um, However, in, in this, it never actually describes how it floated. We know it was possible because these planets all had a, a sort of liquid atmosphere which was uh, not much denser than air, but was significantly uh, denser than air. Uh, whereas in Flash Gordon, I still remember the images of a guy with a, a shovel shoveling the radium into the reactors <laughs> <laughs> in, order, in order to keep the uh, uh, palace uh, floating. Now... <clears throat> Jerry and I did achieve uh, one great uh, ambition, and I'm sure we both remember it very well. Yes. Uh, we, we had a, a chance to take the Hampsons out for dinner in 1979, and that really was an unforgettable evening. And uh, Frank had recovered from, uh, had unexpectedly recovered uh, from a throat cancer. And uh, uh, he confessed that at the time he had actually been uh, previously quite wealthy. Um, but in the expectation he wasn't going to live very long, they decided to live. And, of course, it's one of those curses that he actually survived it and was actually feeling rather poor at the time that, uh, that we met him. So what did I get from Dan Der sort of in retrospect? Well, due to the incredible detail that it was drawn in and... A lot of those cutaways that appeared in the series, which, uh, you know, although you look at it now, it's all nonsense to all technology, but it added credibility to it. Um, I went back uh, quite a few years ago now and sort of studied it fairly closely to see whether it, I could find any way at all of making it hang together. 
And unfortunately, the, the technology in detail doesn't survive uh, scrutiny. Um, with regard to the sort of energies involved, if one day we learn how to manipulate the inner electron shells of atoms, at the moment, all of our chemistry, everything we know, including monatomic hydrogen, <laughs> is due to that piddly sort of less than one volt electron that sits on the outside of the atomic shell. And that's where all, all everything you know, that's going on in this room that we know about most of the time actually comes from. But those inner energies, those inner, the inner electrons, if you shove those around into sort of higher orbits, then that can take several hundred volts. So immediately you can look at the possibility of energies hundreds of times per kilogram of those that we have today. And as far as I know, nobody's actually sort of having a look at whether we could actually get in there and, and do that. If you could, the one little get out clause at the top there, you might actually be able to realize something like the performance of monatomic hydrogen that Frank actually uh, envisaged. The space suits, unfortunately, are always flabby come vacuum or uh, atmosphere, uh, but uh, nonetheless he put a lot of thought into it and he was consulted uh, by the pressure suit engineers from Farnborough uh, to uh, see whether there was anything that they could use there. And I'll come back to the Farnborough pressure suits in a little while. The adventures were essentially revised Flash Gordon. Um, that's not a, a bad thing because they're extremely good adventures. <coughs> Throughout, there's good versus evil, good formula, and uh, uh, the characters were always humorous. I mean, there's a tremendous amount of humor, especially between Pierre and uh, Hank in these, and they were bold and brave and chivalrous. That was sort of one of the most important things with an advanced code of conduct. And the central figures get things done through sort of collaboration, but under strong leadership, so particularly Dundere himself, of course, uh, but Sir Hubert Guest also plays a strong sort of leadership role in there. And to me, these were first-class messages to be sending to young people. And, uh, you know, those young people are now sort of mainly sat in the room, and obviously uh, it didn't do us uh, uh, any particular harm. And I wish there were more, from, from my sort of <coughs> biased perception today, I wish there was more stuff out there today sort of giving similar messages to uh, the youngsters I see. I've got to say... The youngsters that I'm meeting these days have actually improved somewhat to the youngsters I was stumbling across 20 years back. Um, and I think there's been uh, something of a, a change there. There were many social and environmental statements embedded in the stories. And the one that I really, really like is Sondor. Um, when he's uh, sort of uh, moralising to Dander, he has an observation of businessmen shaking hands before they go into a deal to cheat one another. And uh, I think that that is... Uh, quite a strong observation which uh, struck with me. Now, what I've tried to do is to pick a major science fiction story that affected me from uh, uh, each media. And Journey into Space from the radio was a really major influence on me. So one of the first things that uh, was interesting, it was immediately recognisable as being, to me even as a youngster, much more realistic than Dan Dare. Uh, there was all sorts of stuff in it that very, very hard to uh, actually categorise. It was a, certainly a gripping drama, and I mean, I couldn't wait, you know, for the uh, uh, Monday night to uh, listen to it and the repeat on Sundays. Used to drive my parents insane, and I often used to have to go and listen to it in the bathroom. But uh, over the last twenty years, particularly, um, I've been back and looked at this series to see uh, if it really was as sound as it seems. And I have to say, it does stand up incredibly well. Now, although the actual nature of the interaction of the crew and so on, which I'll come on to in a bit, doesn't reflect the way that spaceflight actually went, um, nonetheless, in terms of the technology, uh, it did look uh, very good. Now, I know that uh, um, Charles Chilton was inspired by Destination Moon. And uh, I have a second-hand comment that uh, when he embarked on the series, he, his uh, message was he was going to make the film that destined, make the story that Destination Moon should have been. And uh, so Jerry's already sort of covered Destination Moon, um, the uh, V2s that go to the moon. And uh, the central theme, of course, in Destination Moon is that having made a bit of a pig's ear of the landing, uh, they're short of fuel to get back and therefore have to... Uh, uh, carve everything out of the spaceship in order to be able to get away. So being trapped on the moon was obviously the central story for this. And of course an amazingly successful uh, 
film. Yes. And my mother took me to see that uh, uh, sometime in the early 1950s. And it, it couldn't have been the first round of the cinema, but you know, a very early second round. In Journey into Space, the spaceships were nuclear powered, as the lunar had been in Destination Moon. And when you find out that Ken Gatland had been the advisor to Journey into Space uh, all the way through, it's uh, not surprising that uh, nuclear power was in there. Ken Gatland and, uh, of course, the BIS generally uh, were very much involved in nuclear propulsion back in the early 1950s, late 40s. And nuclear propulsion uh, had been published many times in the uh, uh, journal, particularly including the famous uh, paper by Val Cleaver and Les Shepard, uh, which was 1949, I think, or 1950, I can't remember precisely. And uh, one of the things that Val Cleaver had said to me when I used to work uh, directly for Val uh, was that he had been quite surprised that the moon had actually been reached without nuclear power, that it had been done chemically. So it was, it was quite uh, interesting that uh, all of that had been uh, looked at. The spaceships were all straight out of Von Braun, except all the chemistry had been replaced by nuclear power. And if you do the calculations with uh, exhaust velocities in that sort of range, which were the numbers that uh, Ken Gatlin was showing in the papers that he was publishing the BIS, then you get to the sort of things that were used in the story. And the, traje the fast trajectories to Mars, pretty much spot on. I've uh, modelled all of those. So, yeah, I'm a nerd. I, I admit it. It's, uh, um, but things, things like this can be quite fascinating. I also think that uh, going back and looking at what science fiction writers gave us as an expectation of the future is actually useful because it tells us what the public, what people actually want to see out of a transportation system. And it's not what we've actually got today on rockets, but that's, that's a slight aside. We've still got a lot to strive for, and hence uh, that's where Skylon, I hope, uh, eventually comes in. In the first uh, series, the, the Lunar was clearly the prototype vehicle, and in other episodes they refer to uh, uh, flight numbers such as Lunar 142, and you can quite quickly deduce if you sit around and push the numbers about that um, Charles Chilton was anticipating that be a flight every two weeks to the moon. Uh, hence the flight numbers and so on, uh, each lifting perhaps 100 tonnes to the moon to put the uh, <coughs> lunar base together, which figured so strongly in the uh, second series, which was the uh, Martian series. Very briefly, in the first series, it was a trip to the moon, meeting time travellers, uh, getting back to an, an Earth long before uh, uh, the, the present day, or so 40,000 years ago, describes the astronomy which they deduced, the age that they were in and so on. All very, very well done. Second series was a trip to Mars, where, again, the ancient Martian civilization was there. Uh, in the third series, which continues the sort of Martian bit where the, Mar where the Martians invade the Earth, and we find the astounding conclusion, there's only one Martian left. And having uh, cocked up the invasion of Earth through hypnosis, he then uh, decides to head off to Alpha Centauri. So, having put all that into it, how realistic was it? Well, the time travel. Kurt Gödel, uh, using the equations of relativity, had actually found that uh, relativity had actually got what was referred to as uh, uh, pathogenic behaviour. And the reason is that uh, if the universe has got even a small amount of angular momentum, it turns out that there are trajectories in the universe which, are, which form what are known as closed time-like lines. And if you followed a fast trajectory out into such a universe and back again, you could travel backwards or forwards in time in the universe. And uh, clearly, uh, Chilton had picked up on this. I did ask him about that. And although I personally <coughs> haven't seen it, he maintains that in the early 1950s that uh, there was quite a lot of uh, yes. uh, um, reports about that particular aspect of the Gödel universe. The actinic ray theory... Um, the time travellers repeatedly say there is sufficient energy arrived from the sun every day to drive all our machines, no oil, etc. And uh, when radioactivity was first discovered, uh, the actinic ray theory was such that uh, it was believed that something was arriving from the sun that certain atoms could pick up and generate energy before it was realised that 
atoms which had always been regarded up until then as being uh, sort of absolutely immutable uh, sometimes fell apart and even Madame Curie uh, had given consideration to uh, the actinic ray. The planet Mars, if you, uh, Patrick Moore uh, produced a paper in the BIS in 1954 which he summarised the current knowledge, that's absolutely what Chilton took, there's no question about that and uh, all the modelling I've done to check uh, whether Chilton had it right or not has all been based on, on that rather than the Mars that we know today. And I've already said that the astrodynamics is essentially correct. So, the pressure suits. Well, Chilton managed to borrow for the publicity shots a pressure suit from Farnborough. And uh, those pressure suits were actually being developed at the time. Uh, I spoke to Mike Harrison before he died and uh, that is a real pressure suit that was being developed because it was considered that to get into Russia we were going to have to have very high flying bombers and the crews were going to be wearing suits like that. They were not developing spacesuits and in the UK we have never actually developed a spacesuit. But uh, the pressure suits that we were developing at the time we decided that the high altitude bombing route was sort of fundamentally flawed after the Russians demonstrate they could shoot down Gary Powers. Um, that ended the pressure suit development in the UK. But as many of you realise, the uh, water-cooled sort of undergarment went on to be part of the Apollo spacesuits, and so quite a lot of that uh, uh, technology found its way into the uh, American program. In the second series, one of the uh, important aspects was uh, that Earthmen could be conditioned to live on Mars. Uh, this was done by some sort of mechanism of hypnosis, um, which there was an awful lot of nonsense spouted in the 1950s. Um, but uh, one of the things was to reduce the body temperature by 10 degrees C. And again, Chilton must have been very well advised because you had to do that if you were able to uh, avoid uh, blood boiling, um, which uh, at average temperature we are now, blood will boil when the pressure gets to 47 millimetres of mercury. Uh, if you drop it by 10 degrees C, then uh, it drops to uh, 9.2. Also, uh, there's problems getting carbon dioxide out of your lungs at uh, normal temperature if you're on Mars. Um, so the conditioning was absolutely right. Television <coughs> hypnosis. Now, Charles Chilton told me that uh, he was not aware of the fact that uh, at Alexander Palace in 1946, um, one of the dangers of television that had been uh, flagged up was could television be used for mass control? And they carried out successful trials using television hypnosis uh, at Alexander Palace in 1946. And I have an interesting report on that. So all of the stuff that Chilton put in there, despite the fact he claims not to have known about those trials, is actually sort of fairly realistic. With his hypnotised Martians, although uh, Charles had, was sort of fairly non-committal about this, I think that he got the idea from this quite remarkable book by uh, Cedric Allingham and uh, where Allingham claims that whilst walking in the highlands of Scotland uh, this flying saucer landed uh, very much in the uh, uh, trail of uh, George Adamski um, however telepathy never figured in this uh, conversation he had a, a sort of uh, sign language I'm not sure what sign but he had a sign language conversation with the Martian and uh, um, got certain information However, I'll leave it up to you to go and look up Cedric Allingham on Wikipedia. And somebody mentioned Patrick Moore earlier. And I think that you will find that Patrick Moore knew something about this uh, at the time. And I'm going to say no more since uh, I don't wish to be uh, sued by his uh, uh, executors. Chilton also looked at uh, transport within atmospheres. In the first series, the lunar flu in the Earth's atmosphere, um, the discovery flu in the atmosphere of Mars, uh, the freighter number one on Mars, which was reconfigured a bit like von Braun's freighters, uh, flew on Mars, and then they had Martian land trucks. Again, being a nerd, I've modelled all of that, and particularly the flight of, flight of freighter number one on Mars, when the range is quoted, absolutely correct. I mean, you can stick in the appropriate lift, drag coefficients, the weight of the vehicle, all of which you can get a good handle on by listening carefully to the stories, and it all adds up. So another ambition that uh, achieved for myself is that thanks to Adrian Perkins, 
uh, had a day out with uh, uh, Charles and his wife uh, back in 2003. And I've got to admit that that, that really was uh, uh, quite a memorable day. Uh, Adrian unfortunately had an accident on that day, which uh, we had to get the uh, medics out to him. And I finished up covered in Adrian's blood. And uh, I was standing on Paddington Station covered in blood thinking what a great day it had been. <laughs> I, uh, I was slightly sort of off on, off the world. A well-known politician whose name I won't use but was associated very much with the cancellation of uh, much to do with the UK space programme came wandering past. And it took me a second before I realised that uh, Mr. No, Mr. Ben, I was going to call him, but anyway, uh, had just wandered by. And I realised it would have been a classic moment, couldn't I? Because I could have gone up and said, you're next. And, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway, I, I lost the moment, unfortunately. But, uh. So what did I get from Journey into Space? There's something about a programme like this where the underlying technology is correct, where an immense amount of thought has gone into it, in which you just know it's right. You don't have to have technical knowledge, and the public at large know it's correct. And to me, I don't understand where that is, but people do you know, have an intuition for that. The adventures were about humans pushing themselves into the unknown. It was a central theme that uh, um, there was teamwork and all of that sort of thing, but one of the great things is uh, the crew were individual and fractious, whereas in Dunder they were all sort of cooperative, and hence more realistic. Now, you should try working at reaction engines and you'll know exactly <laughs> what I mean about all of that. Again, many social and environmental statements were embedded in the stories, and the destruction of the Earth through profit, lack of conservation occurred in all of those stories. So again, a resonance with the sort of messages that... Uh, uh, Frank Hampson was uh, carrying. There are some thought provokers. What drove the time traveller ships and the Martian vessels didn't obviously conserve momentum, but I can give you an idea about that in the coffee break if you're interested. And then the real bitch, never been able to find out what the, t the name of the 20th crewman was in the mission. It's uh, completely missing, and uh, if you're a nerd, then uh, that, that is uh, vexing. Finally, then, I want to uh, deal with Quatermass and the pit. Uh, this was a very this was television, so I've covered radio, television, and uh, uh, comics. Um, it terrified a huge audience every week. The number of people I've spoken to in later life about Quater Mass and the Pit, and they said, "Yeah, I watched that from behind the sofa." You know, it, uh, um, it, it was very realistic and uh, set in an austere post-war Britain. Um, it contained a huge amount of factual material. Um, but it, unlike the other things, it wasn't an extrapolation into the future. They were using the knowledge of the day to try to understand something that had happened. They unearthed a strange device amid uh, ancient fossils in uh, Knightsbridge in London. Now, I've watched this many times now, and I still find it very thought-provoking. So just very quickly, what's the story about? There's an archaeological find in London, an early ancestry plus back uh, sort of several million years. Um, Meanwhile, uh, Quatermass, who's running the sort of British rocket effort, is having a fight with the government over how it's all going to go forward, and they're trying to hijack his uh, uh, rocket establishment for military uses. I know exactly how he felt. Um, meanwhile, back at the excavation, something else sort of uh, gets unearthed, and it turns out to be some form of uh, vessel or vehicle, and uh, it's uh, obviously contemporary with the fossils. Um, Harwell is mentioned in the series. They make measurements and find that there are artificial isotopes which give the dating of five million years old, which everybody concludes is completely impossible. And the military mind has immense difficulty sort of coping with this. Even when they find the, dis the uh, actual crew of dead aliens, uh, it turns out that uh, this vessel is still active and command forces which are beyond even... Uh, our, our uh, understanding today and um, can certainly manipulate human beings. Finally, the uh, alien vessel makes a uh, attack to take over the world and it's turned out that the Earth is in fact a uh, surrogate colony of uh, ancient Mars and uh, uh, as I say, the vessel tries to take over but of course we manage to win. So, 
what can I say about it? Well, the quality of science was really, really good. Uh, one of the things that, to me, is quite remarkable is that back in those days, there was so much science in the press. It wasn't all dumbed down like it is today. People were expected to be able to read, understand, and log it. And so names like Von Braun, everybody knew who Von Braun was. He'd been chucking sort of uh, rather nasty things at us a few years before. Harwell was a household name and, and possibly still is. But Jodrell Bank, Bernard Lovell, everybody knew who these people were. Um, the non-humanoid aliens, I thought, were tremendous. Uh, so the other things that I've mentioned, uh, generally the, the, the aliens were humanoid. They got two arms, two legs, you know, all right. They got funny heads and all that sort of stuff, and maybe more than five fingers. Only in the Red Moon mystery, in, in the stories I'm talking about, had something different to uh, have been appeared. So these, tri uh, these tripod arthropods with their hive culture uh, were actually uh, uh, rather uh, exciting. And the fact that they were purging genetic differences from their society on a regular basis uh, had an awful sort of uh, resonance with the race riots, which were sort of a fundamental aspect of uh, that time. What about Quatermass himself? He was a, a very strong leader, even to the extent of being arrogant, I think you'd say today. Um, but he was a man on his own out against authority, and the authority that he was dealing with was intellectually his inferior. He wasn't an action man like uh, Dan Dare or Jet Morgan. He, he was uh, just an intellectual. He, he'd used in the series strong logical reasoning that took him to a conclusion which even he didn't like, and that is that the population of Earth and its intelligence had actually been engineered by the Martians. And he, 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 he got an emotional desire to reject it, but he aim, overcame that with his own intellect. And his absolute frustration was that he couldn't get the government people to understand any of that. And only Roney, his close friend, uh, was uh, the guy that uh, went along with it. So in summary, I've, I've outlined three very different uh, science fiction stories that reached me. There were others. Uh, there was The Lost Planet, which was an Angus McVicker story on the radio, which was also uh, sort of pretty good. And th there were several other uh, television uh, series, but these, to my mind, were outstanding. They all carried important messages urging us to change our ways to avert certain doom, either because of the fact we were mucking up the environment or because of our own aggression. But uh, particularly, they emphasise the roles of leadership, teamwork, intelligence, and determination as essential tools to address those problems. But what I don't want to do is get bogged down in that, because what we've got to remember, they were all absolutely cracking good stories. And I don't know about everybody here, but every week you were waiting for the next episode to come along. And that, that really was uh, sort of great. Uh, there we go. That's my contribution to this. So what's next, Alison? Any Alison? questions? We've got uh, a bit of a break now for coffee, I think. So uh, there's one at the back there. Yep. Um, yeah. Um, one, one question. Um, daring to take issue. <laughs> daring to take issue with you, uh, which is a, a terrifying thought. Um, but um, you were pointing out about the calibre of uh, people in the last 20 years. Well, that's one of those from 20 years ago, I object rather strongly um, and point out that of my peer group, there are only three of us involved in space that I know of in the UK. All the rest had to go elsewhere because there was no space industry to Absolutely. speak of. Um, I, I had the situation with Bob Parkinson in the, in the last um, year where he said something about, oh, we need another generation of rocket scientists. And I said, they're already here. Yes. And I can give you a list of 20-odd people right now who are in their 40s, who I could give a pad of paper to, who've got a copy of Sutton on their shelf and could design you a rocket engine. But they're lost. I absolutely accept that, Richard. And uh, for another day's debate, one of the things that puzzles me is, given all this stuff, and the influence that he had on you know, many people. I cannot understand why Britain, you know, uh, Jerry has already said, we were out there in front, 1962, you know, the Americans were following our sort of turbulent web. And uh, 
what happened after that? Somewhere around about 1965, a guy named Harold Wilson got in. Um, he commissioned something called the Plowden Report. And from that Plowden Report stemmed the complete annihilation of the sort of uh, adventurous side of the aerospace industry. We still make a lot of money out of selling sort of weapon systems and so on into the Middle East and all of that sort of stuff from the aerospace industry. But all the adventurous stuff stopped. And we handed it, you know, lock, stock and barrel to the Americans. Um, <laughs> Wedgwood Ben went further than that. I mean, he absolutely uh, annihilated all of the rocket propulsion work. And, of course, nothing there. So we've now got, as you quite rightly say, a, gener a, a generation in which there's people out there want to do it. But we've got a, to my mind, very difficult to understand attitude in government who've been subject to these same influences, and yet it didn't have the effect on them that it had on uh, everybody in here. Isn't, isn't it ironic that it was that government that came up with the term the white heat of technology? Yes. <laughs> well, now you're trying to get my back up. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I voted for the rat. But, uh, the, the, talent, the talent has to some extent um, sort of it, it's gone sideways and because people didn't have the, the opportunity within an industry so to speak you'll find tremendous innovation went on in amateur rocketry and you look at things like the UK Rocketry Association and you can find tremendous talent there even now. I think uh, all that I can do uh, Richard is refer to the slide where I point out that uh, uh, Quatermass was dealing with people that who were his intellectual inferiors. <laughs> um, I think it was uh, Napoleon that quoted uh, the British as being a nation of lions led by donkeys. So uh, I think that remains. Well, in your defence as, as a leader, it, it has to be said to everyone here that um, when you found me, I was wan wandering around playing with amateur rockets. Yes. So you, you certainly saved me. <laughs> right, well, right, well, thank you very much. Um, before we go for coffee, thank you. Oh, there's one more uh, behind you. Behind you, there's another one there. Oh, sorry. Slightly less technical or, or personal thing. Do I remember rightly? Didn't the guy who played Jet Morgan end up as one of the Labour politicians? He did, he, yes. he did, and he was uh, dead set against us. Uh, yes. Um, <laughs> well, I can't well, remember we're his name. Next to him at a restaurant. In yeah. You were with me, wasn't you? Yeah, yeah. 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 we didn't yeah. do anything about it. You know? yeah. <laughs> but you're right. I mean, uh, he was very, he was very negative. Yeah. I've forgotten that. Yeah. 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 I mean, he was more incomprehensible. Yeah. Well, there's a question. Yeah. Yeah, it's an observation, really. But um, it's, it seems to me that economics comes into the exploitation of space a, a great deal and that its continental size economies can afford to spend that two or three percent of their GNP on space activities and in some ways I think scientists could see this coming because people like Sir Harry Massey who was the instigator of the Skylark sounding rocket program he was I think they could see the fact that a European size economy was necessary to support such an industry and activity because he was one of the sort of founding members of ESRO, the precursor to ESA, and um, played an important part in establishing that, as I think Roy Gibson was the first uh, chairman or whatever of ESRO. And they could see that they had to operate on a continental size economy, which, of course, is what happened in the end. So that, that's just a thought. What I've never been able to understand, though, is Britain always has pled poverty, and you know, we can't afford this, we can't, we, I mean, just at one stage, we would nuclear power, we've got big bombers, we've got all these research aircraft, you know, we, we, we led on all of so many fronts that Jerry has already outlined. We've always played poverty since sort of the mid-1960s, which is why we've run everything down. And yet the French have still got nuclear power, they've got uh, independent uh, aircraft industries. Mainly the Ariane 5 rocket was sort of 78% paid for by the French. Why is it that you know, a nation who was devastated in World War II has managed to do all those things and everybody sort of points to the French economy and says it's rubbish and yet there they are, better standard of health care and everything that we've got in Britain and yet in Britain we still are pleading, you know, we can't afford it, we've managed to crash the economy. 
Is it a coincidence that those businessmen that Sondor was sort of, uh, uh, so uh, deprecating about are really the reason why we're in this state and uh, Europe is in, in general a rather better state as far as technology is concerned? I'm not saying that any of us in here are enjoying a poor standard of living. It obviously works, but we don't quite get the intellectual buzz out of uh, all of this stuff. And Richard being there and knows about it. Oh, I don't need a microphone. You, don't, you no, can no. shout for more. <laughs> anyway, I'll infect it. And everybody this is <laughs> I was going to say that uh, the uh, one of the things you've got to realise is that in Dan Bear's time, in the Golden Age in the 50s, it was all government funded. And the and after that was used as a political excuse, after, you know, by Britain earlier, and now the United States no longer there's a, a Cold War, government funding collapses. And technology goes on and on, and suddenly there becomes commercial reasons for going into space. So a lot of the revival is actually dread, uh, driven for commercial reasons, with government funding by the back door, such as SpaceX, I'm talking about. And uh, so the, the generation that was lost, yours, Richard, you fell into the hole in the middle. But uh, <clears throat> it, in fact, I, CST was started purely because of that reason, because they took me off what was a space project, the Skylark program, when that was axed, uh, you know, and uh, uh, I sort of ran around wondering what to do and formed the company in complete naivety with, with, with Alan. But there was a market at that time which was just starting, which was the London insurance market, you know, which, which actually we still have customers in the insurance business. So there will be a, there could be a commercial revival, revival, you know, in space. But I'm not so sure we'll see the, you know, the the government funding the way it was in the golden age. We've we've left scientific communism behind, and it wasn't lines led by donkeys. I think that was Clemenceau. No, it was we're a nation of shopkeepers. So that's, <laughs> that was even more condemning. But we we you know that's what we are, and maybe we'll get back into space that way. Faith of mine is led by a dog. All right, well, okay. it's pretty said it was a nation of shopkeepers as well. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> One last question. We have, we have time. Well, again, an observation, really, rather than a question. And we've talked about government involvement or lack of it, whatever. Um, a few years ago, I became aware of uh, the European Space Agency's um, project for. Um, investigating the moon and Mars and so forth, uh, Aurora. And the idea was that this would be funded on a four or five year basis by each of the European Space Agency uh, member states. And at the end of that, they would then decide whether they wanted to raise or lower their involvement uh, level and their funding uh, as well with that. And we were at the time coming up to the next point at which a decision had to be made. And I asked, what is being done to make sure the UK makes the right decision? And the answer was from everyone, I've no idea. So I said, well, I'll do something. And I set up a, um, a website called UK for Aurora. And at all of the talks that I had been booked to give, I contacted the various people and said, I'm going to spend 15 minutes talking about Aurora at the end. And what I did was to explain what Aurora was, explain the benefits of UK involvement, and encourage people to write to their MP to express their support and ask them to tell their MP to pass that on to the appropriate people. So when the science minister at the time, Lord Sainsbury, stood up at the press conference to announce that UK was fully funding their part in this, he actually looked down at me in the audience and said public opinion was a factor in the decision. And now I've no idea how many people wrote to their MPs, but I learned afterwards that if an MP receives three letters about an issue, then they take note of it. If they receive 10 letters, they take it seriously. And I think that what that campaign showed was simply that writing to your MP does actually work. And we have an opportunity 
coming up in the very, very near future, like next month, um, to see if we can make an impact on this. So I'd suggest to everybody, write to your MP and say, in view of the fact that the UK space industry is now worth, uh, are we up to 10 billion? 11.3 billion. 11. 11 .3 billion. Um, what do you personally um, plan to do in your constituency to, uh, to help that and, uh, to, and to help the country? Alistair, what percentage of that 11.3 billion is made up by Sky TV? Though? Yeah, 10 billion. Yeah. 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 So exactly. actually the industry is only worth about 1.3 billion per annum. But it is, yeah. it, it is been growing at a rate better than industry with the rest right. of the country for the last, what, five years or more? 8% is going yeah. very well. Right. One more question over there. Just if you could throw that in. Um, in my experience as a, an ex-scientist also is that one of the differences between France and Germany is that in this country, science and technology seems to have always been shown the sort of tradesman's entrance, um, which is a, a real indigenous problem, I think, which is regardless of economics. So we should bring back the eagle. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll have it, we'll have it on the basis. Right, we'll be going off for coffee now. I think it's going to be through April, but there are leaflets. That John Bonser has put this leaflet out. I think he's got some of them available. But being aware, the 24th to 31st of August is the International Rocket Week. The 30th annual amateur rocket week, yeah. and it's happening up, up in Scotland in uh, Paisley, the outdoor centre, uh, Lapwing Lodge. So uh, please grab a coffee. Not at all. Right, coffee outside. Thank you very much, Al.